Welcome to another episode of China Update, where I provide you guys with the most up-to-date political, economic, and geostrategic analysis on the world's number two economy. My name is Tony. Let's jump in. Okay, happy Friday, everybody. First up, the economy and the Politburo, the parties, and thus China's most powerful body, held a special meeting this week to quote analyze the current economic situation and arrange economic work for the second half of the year. End quote. In quite an unusual move, the body implicitly admitted that the growth target of 5.5 percent set at the beginning of this year will likely not be reached. The meeting, also in an unusual move, warned in its typical dry language that the economy is facing quote prominent challenges. End quote. Despite this, though, unsurprisingly, dynamic zero COVID is here to stay for the foreseeable future. The meeting called for work to ensure the real estate market remains stable, and recognizing the mortgage boycott crisis threatening the banking system, demanded local government policies to quote ensure the completion of homes under construction. End quote. Yet another cost to be placed on the back of struggling local governments. More on the housing crisis shortly. The bank protests in Henan have also provoked official concern at the highest levels too. With the meeting deciding, quote, efforts should also be made to maintain the overall stability of the financial market, properly diffuse risks within certain local rural banks, and crack down on financial crimes. End quote. Interestingly, the Politburo meeting readout had an English version and a Chinese version, and there were a few points included in the Chinese version that were not included in the English one, increasing the introduction of foreign capital and technology into the country, as well as promoting the Belt and Road Initiative. Now, while we're on the economy, let's discuss the housing crisis. And we have some big news. In the last 48 hours, several leading financial commentators have been discussing official concern that even a one trillion RMB bailout fund will not be enough to revive the property market. We saw before that the Politburo is currently just seeking to stabilize the industry, and this by itself is already a tough policy objective. UK-based Japanese-owned Financial Times reports that the People's Bank of China is seeking to mobilize one trillion RMB, approximately 150 billion US dollars, to bail out developers in order to get thousands of stalled projects representing millions of apartment units completed. Quote. Under the plan recently approved by China State Council, the banks will use the People's Bank of China loans, along with their own funds lent at market rates, to refinance stalled real estate projects. But bank executives and analysts have warned that the People's Bank of China may struggle to raise its targeted amount, given the difficulties banks will face in making a return on distressed real estate projects. End quote. One executive at a state lender is reported as expressing, quote, "Many unfinished projects have zero or negative value after taking into account their existing debts. We are not going to touch such projects, even if it is politically correct to do so." End quote. At any rate, even if the central bank could set up this fund, many analysts and some officials in private have expressed that a 150 billion dollar bailout. Is nowhere near enough to stimulate a crisis-hit sector representing over one fifth of the nation's economy. Indeed, conservative estimates expect that the home buyer mortgage boycotts alone are expected to affect more than 140 billion U.S. dollars worth of loans. Not to mention the backdrop of a Chinese economy which slowed to just 0.4 percent officially in the second quarter. Also, stimulating growth in the property market means reviving household confidence that home prices will rise. But we remember that home prices in May fell for their tenth consecutive month, and according to estimates from S and P, China's property sales are likely to further drop by 30 percent by the end of this year. But many China analysts, including yours truly, maintain that complete financial or economic collapse remains unlikely. Beijing has the policy and political tools to prevent such a destabilizing disaster from occurring. Indeed, the more likely risk is of painful and permanent growth slowdown, which arguably is already well underway. And if the current crises are mismanaged, there is a risk too of growth reduction, skyrocketing debt, and prolonged stagnation. Though we could be wrong, China's economy could end up doing much better. Or much worse.
Hey guys, if you enjoyed the video, don't forget to hit the like button. If you're not subscribed and you do enjoy the content, you want to keep watching, maybe consider subscribing. And anyone who wants to go the extra mile and help keep China Update sustainable, help me create a channel that is primarily supported through subscriber support rather than corporate sponsorship, which is my ultimate goal with the channel. Patreon and Buy Me A Coffee links are in the description below. As always, thank you so much everybody for the ongoing support. On Thursday, US Time General Secretary Xi Jinping and US President Joe Biden spoke over the phone in a conversation planned by both sides for weeks now. Currently, we only have official readouts, statements from the White House, and Chinese state media accounts, all of which are typically for a domestic audience. The Biden administration said the conversation was, quote, part of an effort to keep rising tensions between the two countries at bay. End quote. In the official Chinese readout, she expressed that it was a mistake to, quote, view China as the primary rival and the most serious long-term challenge. End quote. We may get leaks in the following days regarding more candid details of the conversation. It appears that a deal has not been reached regarding U.S. tariffs on hundreds of billions of dollars of Chinese goods, for example. What is clear, though, is that Taiwan was discussed, and she is reported to have not minced words. In a statement posted on the Chinese Foreign Ministry website after the two leaders talked, she, though not mentioning U.S. House of Representatives Speaker Nancy Pelosi's possible visit, said China would, quote, resolutely safeguard China's national security and territorial integrity, end quote. He also told the U.S. President, quote, those who play with fire will perish by it. It is hoped that the U.S. will be clear-eyed about this, end quote. One Washington-based outlet writes, asked whether the U.S. interpreted the comments as a threat, a senior administration official said China has regularly used the metaphor previously when discussing Taiwan. As we have explored in recent days, the possible Pelosi trip has blown up into a full-blown diplomatic incident between Washington and Beijing, as well as a domestic political issue within the U.S. itself. Despite EU and Japanese lawmakers making trips to Taiwan recently, with relatively little fuss from China, Beijing has decided that this is a hill that it is willing to fight on. Since Monday, China has issued six official warnings, including from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Ministry of National Defense, and the Taiwan Affairs Office of the State Council, quote, stressing the danger of the U.S. provocations, end quote. And now we can add Xi Jinping himself to that list. Chinese military and political commentators have been quick to warn of the real risk of kinetic conflict, like this academic speaking to Hong Kong media yesterday. Quote, Beijing has tremendous means to push Pelosi to give up her plan. In terms of military options, for example, the PLA might announce a no-fly zone and restricted navigation zone for military exercises near the Taiwan Strait, forcing Pelosi's aircraft to make a detour if she insists on visiting Taiwan. End quote. Outside of a reckless response that quickly escalates, it still seems very unlikely that Beijing would risk starting a war with the United States. However, the U.S. military is not taking any chances. The New York-based Associated Press writes, for example, that if Pelosi goes to Taiwan, according to officials, the military would increase its movement of forces and assets into the Indo-Pacific region. Quote, fighter jets, ships, surveillance assets, and other military systems would likely be used to provide overlapping rings of protection for her flight to Taiwan and any time on the ground there. End quote. Indeed, it's being reported too that the U.S. air carrier, the USS Ronald Reagan, and its strike group, including a guided missile destroyer and a guided missile cruiser, set out from Singapore on Monday of this week, heading northeast towards the South China Sea. Is there a real threat of military conflict with this Taiwan visit? Or is this just face-saving rhetoric? Well, House Speaker Pelosi left for her trip to the Asia-Pacific region today, Friday, but it's still unclear whether her stops will include Taiwan. So I guess we will find out in the coming days. Though it's worth pointing out that this week, on Wednesday, Taiwan hosted a parliamentary delegation from Japan's national diet, led by former Japanese defense ministers Shigeru Ishiba and Yasukazu Hamada. The trip proceeded without any issues. Okay, that is today's episode of China Update. Thank you so much, everybody, for watching. I'll see you tomorrow.